the FDA started doing purity tests on certain lots of the talcum powder, and they found traces of asbestos in the baby powder. Have you or a loved one gotten sick or worse because you use J&J &J talc baby powder? And what can you do? Well, that's what we're going to ask the lawyer on today's episode. Hi again, everybody. I'm Rob Rosenthal, and my guest is attorney Jason Brown, based in New Jersey. Jason, thank you for making some time to answer our questions today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So we've been hearing for a few years about this litigation with Johnson & Johnson and the talc powder. Catch us up on what the latest is. What's going on these days? Well, there's been some big developments and big with a capital B. Wow. There was a $4.7 billion verdict in the St. Louis courts regarding a jury finding that talcum powder had caused ovarian cancer in 22 different women. And just last week, the appellate division of Missouri came back and upheld the verdict. They slashed it by a couple billion, still leaving $2 billion on the books for this liability. And some of the language that they went into was pretty acidic when they started digesting the conduct of Johnson & Johnson. The appellate division indicated it was with convincing clarity that Johnson & Johnson engaged in outrageous conduct and then a reasonable inference from somebody who adduced all the facts at trial was that Johnson & Johnson consciously disregarded the safety of the consumer for its own products when they knew that the talcum in their products could cause cancer. That is big news. Tell me, what does that mean for other uh, litigation that may be ongoing or maybe that hasn't even begun yet? Well, th there's a lot of ramifications. First of all, uh, a couple weeks before this, Johnson & Johnson has pulled baby powder slash talcum powder from the market. And I can get into that in a second and how that relates to the, the macro parts of the litigation. Okay. But what I think Johnson & Johnson has been suffering from is a crisis of credibility and a crisis in leadership. Uh, part of their defense in which they structured around the talcum powder ovarian cancer link is that there's no way their product could have caused ovarian cancer since there's nothing in it that they thought was a contaminant or a, a, a carcinogen, a cancer-causing substance. Plaintiff's counsels had alleged all along that there's traces of talc, uh, excuse me, traces of asbestos in their talcum powder. The defense counsel then parried saying, the plaintiff's counsels are villains. They're just making this stuff up. Where are they getting their data from? Well, last year, Reuters conducted a secret investigation into the talcum powder. And guess what? they found that there were traces of asbestos in the talcum powder. But that's not all. In 2019, in September, the FDA started doing purity tests on certain lots of the talcum powder, and they found traces of asbestos in the baby powder. So Johnson & Johnson's credibility with their defense is shot. They then tried to evolve and move on saying, well, maybe there is some traces, but so what? Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody believes them at this point. So what would be your best guess what's going to happen next? Well, if you look at the context of this litigation and compare it to other big mass tort litigation, in the news last week, for example, the Roundup litigation, mm -hmm. uh, the Roundup case after many, many years of litigation settled for $10.9 billion on behalf of all the individuals that had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, part of the characteristics that induced a settlement in that litigation are present here in this litigation. That is, the company has been socked with multiple big verdicts, some in the tens of millions, the hundreds of millions, and now the billion dollar verdict that's been sustained on the appeal. Plus, there is an event now with the product being pulled in the market where Johnson & Johnson can use that date to try to tie off its liability. As I predicted with the Roundup litigation, I said it's coming home and I think that uh, they're gonna resolve the case. That's what I'm predicting too for the uh, ovarian cancer talcum powder litigation. I do believe it's in the final stretch, although nothing's guaranteed. But my forecast has been dead on uh, for the last couple of litigations where I did forecast, I think there was going to be a resolution. So that begs the question then, Jason, if there's somebody who uh, ha has had uh, ovarian cancer or that thinks it's traced to the talc, uh, does that mean it's too late? Can they still get in on, on litigation? If somebody unfortunately used extended periods of time of Johnson & Johnson talcum powder or baby powder in their private area and then was diagnosed, unfortunately, with ovarian cancer or lost a loved one, we're still taking cases, we're still looking at the cases. 
The cases may be greatly impacted by the different statute of limitations uh, state by state. We still, our firm is based in New Jersey, but we take cases all over the country. We'll still look at the case if somebody has had an unfortunate experience with the product. Uh, by some measures, some states will apply the statute of limitations from the date of diagnosis and when the person could or should have known that the bad product, the baby powder, caused the cancer. By other measures, sometimes they'll apply the statute of limitations from when the product was pulled from the market. And since it was just pulled a few weeks ago, people may have a renewed attempt to get their cases into court and vindicate themselves and obtain some measure of justice for unfortunately being plagued by ovarian cancer because Johnson & Johnson hid the risks of the link between talcum powder and ovarian cancer. So it may not be too late, but there is definitely a sense of urgency if, if, you, if things move along as quickly now as you are uh, predicting they are. There certainly is a sense of urgency on multiple levels. Uh, you want to make sure you get all the records and time is not necessarily on your side. Also with these mass tort litigations, I always use the analogy, you're either on the bus or off the bus. Uh, if you have representation and you're part of the litigation and the date that they announce these global settlements, oftentimes you're on the bus and you can participate in the settlement. If you don't and you wait and you just take a wait and see approach to see what happens, then you may not be able to participate. Uh, just analogizing again to the Roundup settlement that was just announced, mm -hmm. individuals that had representation as of a certain date certain are entitled to at least go through the mechanisms to try to resolve their case in that $10.9 billion structure. Individuals after a certain date will have to go through a whole different process and a much more complicated process. So it's strongly encouraged to consult with the council. We'd love to talk to people who are unfortunately injured, uh, but if, even if it's not our firm, we strongly encourage individuals to consult with an attorney to learn their rights. Uh, that brings up another question I'll get to in just a second, but I just want to uh, stress, what about family members? What if someone died from ovarian cancer and their family members think there's a link? Uh, can they uh, sue on their behalf? Well, it, it's horrific if that occurred and it was preventable because Johnson & Johnson concealed the risk. But yes, uh, the loved ones of an estate certainly can bring an action. The statute of limitations in that instance may be greatly impacted based upon the date of loss. Mm -hmm. And again, our sympathy goes out. And our sympathy goes out much more than the sympathy of Johnson & Johnson, who up until a few weeks when they pulled the product have been in complete denial about what everybody knew and what their internal, internal documents had showed. And Jason, when it comes to picking an attorney to help in, in this specific uh, situation, what's your advice? What, what should people look for? What are some uh, uh, criteria they should use? Well, I think they should look for a firm that's been through it before, that has a track record, track record of success in this area. If you look at me, uh, I've taken mass tort litigation from end zone to end zone, meaning I was the one who originated the first battery of cases and a couple of mass torts. And I was the one that was intimate in some resolution of some of these mass torts. So our firm certainly has a track record of success. Again, nothing's guaranteed. Our firm handles this case 100% on a contingency basis, meaning we're only paid if we win the case. If we spend tens of thousands or more on the case and we lose the case, nobody owes us a penny. We just eat those as uh, losses and write it off as a cost of doing business. We don't like to lose, it happens sometimes, but we want to represent people and want them to have the comfort to know when you're using our services, you don't get a bill at the end mm -hmm. if the case doesn't proceed the way you think it does. Great information, and thank you for getting us caught up on the very latest in this situation, Jason. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you very much for having me. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been attorney Jason Brown. If you want the best information or you'd like to be able to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, make sure to go to askthelawyers.com. Also, please take a sec to like, share, and subscribe by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Rob Rosenthal with askthelawyers.com.